Hello, this is Russell Moore, and you're listening to The Russell Moore Show, brought to you by Christianity Today. Every week, we explore here conversations and questions from a Christian perspective to help you sort out how to live as a follower of Jesus in confusing times. And this week, we have a conversation to seek to do just that. Identity politics is something that people are talking about in all kinds of places right now. And there's an intriguing new book out about identity politics and the related issues around it by Yasha Munk, who's an expert on issues in liberal democracy, the rise of populism, threats to democracy. He's written five books, and he is a professor of uh, the practice of international affairs at Johns Hopkins University. He's a contributing editor at The Atlantic. Senior Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, founder of Persuasion Journal, and host of the Good Fight podcast. And his book is called The Identity Trap, A Story of Ideas and Power in Our Time. Yasha Munk, thanks for joining us on the show today. Thank you so much. I really look forward to this conversation. You know, here in a couple months, I'm going to be back in my hometown. It'll be around Christmas time. And one of the things that I will enjoy will be a uh, Pusheratas, which is a little uh, Croatian uh, sort of a fried donut filled with fruit, nuts, and so forth. That's was was really brought into uh, my hometown a long time ago by the Slavic Ladies Auxiliary. Croatian, mm. initially first generation Croatian immigrants who came to my hometown to work in the seafood industry and other places. How is that not identity politics, the way that you would define it? Well, first of all, I'm grateful that I've had lunch because otherwise I wouldn't be able to concentrate uh, <laughs> picturing this dessert. One day we'll have to eat it together. Um, I don't use the term identity politics very much because it's so overbroad. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for exactly the reasons you, you're saying, you know, part of the beauty of America is that we all have roots in all kinds of parts of the world. And we bring that cultural richness and yes, that cultural diversity with us to this country. And I think it is perfectly natural and normal that the country will continue to be influenced by all of these different cultures, that hopefully we can learn from each other. You might invite me to try this dish and there's a form of cultural exchange happening, but also we're never going to be exactly like each other, that many of us will continue to be proud of our particular kinds of traditions. And, and that's perfectly fine. I also think it's fine that in politics, you sometimes have forms of interest group representation, that people who are descended from the Armenian genocide have formed an association to try and bring more awareness to those terrible events. Or that there's something like mm -hmm. the AARP, which is standing up for the interest of older Americans. All of that is perfectly fine. The subject of my new book, of, of the Identity Trap, is a new set of ideas about race and gender and sexual orientation that goes beyond those forms of interest group politics, that really says that to understand the world, to understand how we relate to each other, to understand the nature of this country, you have to look primarily, exclusively at these kind of identity categories. That is what tells us deep down who you are. And in the process of that, this ideology has embraced such a fundamental, such a radical critique of our institutions that it doesn't just recognize the injustices and the forms of discrimination that obviously do persist in the United States today, but says we've not made any progress on those things and therefore we should rip up our constitution, we should get rid of our most fundamental institutions. You mention in the book that you have seen some things in op-eds in the New York Times that you would have been unimaginable a decade ago to you. I've also seen things sort of from, from my vantage point, such as uh, school boards wanting to ban Ruby Bridges goes to school as critical race theory and so forth, which I never imagined that I would see. How did we end up here? Well, that's a that's a big question. <laughs> you know, I think we're in a sort of spiral of radicalization in the United States. You used to have a Republican Party, which was small c conservative. And part of its conservatism was that it wanted to preserve what is good about the country, preserve the institutions uh, we have. Now I think we have big parts of the Republican Party that are radical or revolutionary in a way, that have put their loyalty towards one man and his particular interest and his particular political vision 
above things like an attachment to the United States Constitution. Now, I also think that there's been this series of intellectual developments, which are chronicle in my book, on the part of the political spectrum that I originally come from and that I still, in certain ways, endorse, and that's the political left. I think we have seen, in part, as an understandable reaction to the election of Donald Trump and to some of those changes on the right of American politics, the embrace of interesting scholarly radical tradition that makes some interesting points about the country, but that really is fundamentally opposed to our liberal democratic institutions as well. These are people, you know, there's two ways of thinking about the flaws in, in the United States, right? One is the tradition of people like Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King Jr. And in a way, Abraham Lincoln, and I would argue in a way, somebody like Barack Obama. And, and that tradition is deeply aware of the flaws of our country, right? When Frederick Douglass was invited to hold a speech to celebrate the 4th of July, he told the crowd, how hypocritical are you to be talking about the Declaration of Independence, to be talking about all men are born equal, while slavery is still persisting in the United States. But the lesson he took from that was not to rip up the Constitution. It was not to get rid of those values. It was to say that we must redouble our efforts to live up to them. He asked, by what right are you excluding people like me from the enjoyment of these ideas? The tradition which stands at the origin of what a lot of people today call wokeness, I prefer the term identity synthesis, rejects that. Right? They say, no, those institutions actually are just meant to pull the wool over people's eyes. Their goal is to perpetuate that form of discrimination. So if you want to make progress, you have to rip these ideas up, rip those values up, and explicitly make how we treat each other, and explicitly make how the state treats all of us, depend on the kind of intersection of identities at which we stand. Now, but they, they am, wouldn't as, call for ripping up the Constitution, would they? They would in important ways. So if you mm. look at the Ford, uh, you know, so critical race theory is something you mentioned a moment ago, right? Mm -hmm. It's this bizarre thing where some polemicists on the right, as you're saying, say, you know, somebody wants to teach our kids about the history of slavery. That's woke. That's critical race theory, right? Mm -hmm. That's absurd. Um, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, we should teach children about the history of slavery. And obviously, we should recognize that there's real ongoing injustices in our country, but there's racism and other forms of discrimination that continue to shape what this country looks like today. But as a result, you've had this kind of strangely soft pedaled version of critical race theory that a lot of the mainstream has now embraced as an interpretation of it. Saying, well, critical race theory, that's just wanting to think critically about the role that race plays in our society. What could be wrong with that? You know, in my book, I really trace the origins of these ideas. It, it comes to fruition with a tradition of critical race theory, which is founded by people like Derek Bell. He comes to conclude that America in the 1970s or in, 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 in the year 2000 is as racist as it was in 1950 or 1850. And so he does explicitly understand himself as a critic of what he calls the defunct racial equality ideology of a civil rights movement. He mocks songs like We Shall Overcome as pious and really leading people in the wrong direction. So yes, I do think that there is a very fundamental disagreement here about the role of a civil rights movement and about the role that universal values, neutral rules, institutions that aim for integration rather than for a new form of progressive separatism should play in our society. You know, a lot of people who take the example of Dr. King, for instance, as a as a representative of colorblindness and often will take uh, the content of our character language from King and sort of rip that out to use the ripping uh, metaphor from from everything else that he said in order to really make the point that there's no such thing as structural or systemic uh, aspects of racism you're not arguing that are you no so i don't find uh, the term of colorblindness particularly helpful because it fails to distinguish between two very different ideas. One is, you know, let's pretend that we don't see color. Let's pretend that race doesn't structure 
the society we live in. And that it clearly does. As I've said a number of times in this conversation, I do believe that there is serious racism in the United States today. I disagree with people like Derek Bell that racism today is as bad as it was in 1950 or as bad as it was in 1850. In fact, I think that's offensive, not to us great Americans living today, but to the people who suffered much, much worse forms of outright exclusion and discrimination in the past. But obviously, there does continue to be discrimination and racism, and we must confront that. We must see that. The question is whether we should reimagine our institutions so that how you're treated is explicitly dependent on the racial group of which you are a part. So let me give you examples of real practices that are happening today that I do worry about, but I do think go well beyond Frederick Douglass's vision and Martin Luther King's vision, and for that matter, the vision of somebody like Barack Obama. You know, I spoke to a woman named Kyla Posey in researching this book. She's an um, African-American educator living in the suburbs of Atlanta. And she asked the principal of her school whether she would be allowed to choose a, a teacher a classroom for her kids. And the principal said, sure, just send me along the name. But when she sent in that name, she kept not getting a response. And when the principal kept suggesting that perhaps there was another teacher who might be better, and eventually Kyla Posey grew frustrated and said, what's going on here? Why can't my daughter go to this class that I think is right for her? And the principal said, well, you see, that's not the black class. Now, you might think this is a story about racism and segregation that is all too familiar until you learn that the principal was a black woman who is deeply politically progressive and that she had imbibed a new set of pedagogical ideas which say that to have the right kind of education, we need to encourage students to think of themselves as racial beings. And that requires them to be around a lot of peers of the same race. And so if this seven, eight-year-old girl were not in a class with a lot of black kids, then she would be harmed. And so against the will of her mother, that is the class she must go to, even though that's not what, what Kyla Posey thought was the right classroom for her kid. We have in many elite private schools in this country, at Dalton School on the Upper East Side of Manhattan and Bank Street School on the Upper West Side in uh, Washington, D.C. in Los Angeles, teachers coming to classroom in the third grade, in the second grade, in the first grade, and selling kids, if you're black, you go over there. If you're Latino, you go over there. If you're Asian American, you go over there. And if you're white, you go over there. That, I think, is a way of separating kids out that is really concerning to me, in part because of what's going to happen to those white kids. I don't worry if they're a little bit uncomfortable. I think being uncomfortable is part of a good education. But the attempt, the, the, the hope here is, as one school puts it, to get them to, get them to own the whiteness, to embrace the European identity to make them think of themselves primarily as white. And they think that's going to turn them into great anti-racist activists. And perhaps that's true for a few of those kids. But if there's one thing I've learned from history and one thing I've learned from social psychology, it's that usually when you're told this is your group, you're going to treat the members of that group relatively well and often the members of other groups a lot less well. So I think this is more likely to create the kinds of racism, the kinds of white supremacists that we're rightly worried about in our politics than it is to produce these great principles anti principled anti-racists. In almost any given day, I get a call from somebody who will say something along the lines of this. I'm a lawyer in a law firm. We're coming up on Pride Month. I'm an evangelical Christian who holds basic Christian Christian ideas about what uh, marriage is or ought to be. I'm happy with all my coworkers. I don't try to impose my views on everybody else. But if I don't sign on to the Pride Month declaration, I'm in trouble. Or if I don't declare my pronouns, I'm in trouble. And I don't know whether or not that's in conflict with my Christian faith. What I notice in that is a lot of fear. So what has happened in terms of sexual orientation, gender identity right now that seems to be beyond just the debates that we would have had in the past about what's right or wrong in terms of marriage structure? I feel that fear in many different social circles in the United States at the moment – 
And it's something that deeply saddens me. One of the things I loved about this country when I first came here as a graduate student in 2007 was the sense that you could have deep political, theological, moral debates with people who had vastly different views from you. And then afterwards you would go to dinner and perhaps get a drink together. Now I'm struck by the extent to which over the course of the last five years I've had lunch, sometimes with friends and acquaintances and whatever walk of life, sometimes with United States senators, with CEOs, with famous uh, columnists. And as a matter of course, after expressing some innocuous point of view, they will say, but of course I would never say this publicly. And that does concern me because I don't think anybody is served well by living in a country in which people can't be their true selves. And I don't think anybody is served well when a lot of the population can smell that the people with real institutional responsibility, the people who have real influence and power, uh, don't tell them the truth, that they say something different to their friends over a meal than they do in public. I think that's actually connected to the crisis of confidence in our institutions that we've had. Now, I do think that one of the reasons for that is that in many mainstream institutions, in many explicitly progressive institutions or, you know, effectively left-leaning institutions, of which I'm a part, right? I'm, I, I inhabit those institutions. I'm not talking about those over there. I'm talking about my friends and colleagues and, and the world that I know very well. We've started to have a moral puritanism, a demand for conformity, which is concerning. I believe in philosophical liberalism. I believe in the idea of live and let live. I believe in the idea that in the United States, you and I and every single one of your listeners have different moral conceptions and different religious conceptions. And the only way this country is going to work is if we give each other the freedom to live in accordance with our own idea of what's right. I think a lot of the ideology that is now on the ascendant goes beyond that, to say that you have to affirm my view of the world. You have to affirm the way that I act and, and, and I think about the world. I am a passionate defender of a marriage equality, and I'm sure that not all of your listeners agree with that. But to me, that was a matter of saying, I want to have the same rights and duties as somebody else. I want to be able to be included under the same institutions, at least when it comes to secular institutions, right? But that doesn't mean that you have to endorse it, right? It doesn't mean that you have to actively say that you support it. It's simply asking for equal treatment. I think a lot of the time, what the ideology I've been talking about demands is an active sign that you agree with seeing questions like gender or sexual orientation in the same way that I do. And unless you're willing to get on board of that, unless you're willing to vocally say, I share that same vision and I see you exactly as you want to see yourself, then you know your boss is going to send you an angry note and you're going to have to go and see HR and you, know, you might be slowly squeezed out of projects at work. Uh, or perhaps there's going to be people on Slack calling for your head. And, and mm -hmm. that, I think, just fundamentally goes against the social settlement that makes a, a wonderfully diverse, tolerant country like the United States work. You, you mentioned the elected officials whispering. I have that experience all the time with Republican elected officials who will whisper about Donald Trump. This is crazy. And Democratic elected officials who will say some of the some of the gender conversation is just insane, especially as it relates to some of these questions about sports and prisons and some of the things that you mention uh, in the book. Is there a better way to talk about that stuff to sort of sort out these these arguments than than the debate over is there such a thing as a woman? So a few thoughts. The first is, you know, my, my book is not about, quote unquote, cancel culture, for it obviously mm -hmm. is touching on some of those points. You know, the core insight here is that the people who can exert pressure on you depend on which walk of life you're in, right? If you are an elected official in the Republican Party, you can offend progressives however much you want. In fact, that gives you accolades. That makes mm -hmm. it more certain that you're going to win your primary race. That makes it more likely mm -hmm. that your friends are going to send you congratulatory texts. But you cannot offend Donald Trump. You cannot express criticisms of him. 
right? In the same way, if you are a member of a progressive organization or of the many institutions in the United States that are facially neutral, but effectively left-leaning, like major universities, then the pressure to comply is from the left. And so sometimes there's this sort of really fruitless debate about, well, you talk about cancel culture on the left, what about cancel culture on the right? Yes, it exists on both sides for different people in different circumstances, and both of those things are very bad. We should want to live in a country in which we don't just have the legal protections of the First Amendment, but the cultural protections of a true culture of free speech in which we accept that we're going to bring our our full selves to the table. You know, on the on the gender question, let me give you an analogy. You were asking about structural racism earlier, right? Mm -hmm. Let's go into that for one second. I'll, I'll bring it back to gender. You know, there is straightforward racism, which is I have negative views about this and that group. I think these people are bad or they're inferior or they're stupid or they're lazy or whatever that view might be. Right? And that is how we used to think about racism for a long time. And now there's this new idea of structural racism, which says reasonably, implausibly, that part of how racist structures continue to exist is uh, not because of the bad intentions of anybody, but because of assumptions we make because of power systems. Right. If a cab driver decides that he doesn't want to pick up a black passenger because perhaps the ride is going to go to, you know, an unsafe neighborhood, he doesn't necessarily have to have ill intentions towards that person. He doesn't have to think terrible things about black people, but it's going to have a structural result that it's much harder for a black person to get a taxi. Right. And that is an injustice that we should be concerned about. So I think that makes sense. The problem comes when activists say that the only conception that makes sense is that of structural racism. And that, you know, when, as happened in Jersey City, a black nationalist mass murderer kills a, a number of Jewish people expressing deeply racist thoughts and sentiments, that can't be racism because... You know, black people can't be racist against anybody else because the only conception of racism that makes sense is structural racism. No, we have to keep both of those conceptions in our mind at the same time. There's the old fashioned form of racism, which has to do with ill will and ill intent. And that continues to be important in many circumstances. And then there's the newer conception of structural racism, which is important as well. And each of these is going to be relevant in different circumstances. All right. Now let's get to sex and gender, right? For a long time, we thought about things in terms of biological sex, right? That is how we know whether somebody is a man or a woman and how they should act in society, how they should be treated in certain kinds of circumstances. There is an insight, which I think is broadly right, that a lot of society is also structured by gender roles, by gender norms, right? Um, by ideas that if you're a respectable gentleman today, men like you and me right now, you wear a jacket to uh, an interview and uh, you don't wear a dress, right? In the 18th century in England, we might have worn dresses because that would have been an appropriate attire for certain men in certain time periods, right? And so clearly there's these gender norms about how you should act. And I think it is right that there are some people in our society who are biologically a member of one sex, but who feel that they uh, want to be governed and want to embrace the gender norms that have historically been associated with the other sex. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about people who are trans. Now, I think that often people uh, experience very strong forms of dysphoria and suffering if they're not allowed to live in accordance with a gender that they've chosen for themselves. And I think we should respect that. We should allow them to live as they wish and we should treat them respectfully. And that is uh, a part of living and letting live. That is part of what it means to live in a free society. But there are going to be some contexts where biological sex remains important. In the same way in which it is a mistake to give up on the old-fashioned concept of racism altogether, in which we need both of those concepts, we will in some contexts need to know about gender and in some contexts need to know about sex. When you're at the doctor's office, it is important for the doctor to know your biological sex for a number of reasons. When you're talking about spaces where women are particularly vulnerable, including prisons and others, it is appropriate to take into consideration the biological sex of the people you're dealing with. 
when it comes to sporting competitions, where we know that having gone through male puberty gives people a significant advantage, you will uh, need to consider biological sex as well. And so then we might have a conflict of interests where some trans women legitimately say, I just want to go and participate in the sport. You know, why, why shouldn't I be able to do that? And then other non-trans female athletes are going to say, well, but if trans women are going to win over competitions, that is unfair to us. And then you have to find compromises that in an appropriate way pay heed to both of those sets of interests. Often, for example, I think at less competitive levels in, in, in sports that aren't things like rugby or something like that, it makes perfect sense to allow trans women to participate in, in female sports competitions. But at the most competitive levels, you might have greater concerns about that. What do you think are the implications for religious communities? When, when you look at, at where we're going as a society when it comes to these identity trap conversations, where do churches and, and, and houses of worship and people who identify, to use, the, to use the language of the day, identify as religious going into the future? Well, the first thing I want to say, and I'm somebody who knows a lot less about theology than you do, so you'll have to help me <laughs> with this argument, is that Christians in particular should be worried about these ideas. One of the most influential pedagogical consultancies now is called Embrace Race. As I was saying earlier, the goal in so many of these institutional settings has been to encourage students to see themselves primarily as racial beings. Now, I have my own reasons to be concerned about that, from, but from a Christian perspective, I imagine that you would want to say that this goes against your most fundamental view of the human soul, of the idea that all humans are made in the image of God and that what gives you your worth is your actions, is your moral status, is how you act in the world, rather than the group into which you're born. And so to me, I am concerned about these ideas as a political liberal, and I'm sure that many of you in the same sense will be philosophical liberals, will believe in those fundamental principles and institutions of the United States. But I think what I've been struck by in thinking about these ideas is what a rich variety of political and moral and religious traditions have reason to be concerned about these ideas for, for reasons of their own. And I think in the, in, the, in the case of Christians, those reasons are particularly strong. You know, at a broader institutional level, religious institutions at the best can be one of the places to facilitate greater mutual understanding. Now, we all know the, the old line, which sadly still has some validity, that the most segregated hour in American life is uh, Sunday morning when people go off to church. But if you are able to integrate your religious community, or if you are part of a religious community that is genuinely multi-ethnic, that I think is a great contribution to making our society better. Because we have decades of uh, research and scholarship in social psychology, which tells us when and how we can overcome prejudices between different groups. It's when we have contact with each other. And when we have contact with each other in context where we're treating each other as equals within that situation, where we share a common goal, and where we're expected to get along, where the message from the relevant authorities is that you expect it to communicate, to see each other, to become brethren. That's true in sports teams. It's one of the reasons why I think it's great for, for kids in high school to, or in middle school or in, or in elementary school to spend more time doing sports and less time being segregated into different racial groups. But it could be true in a religious community as well. So I think that religious institutions have a really important role to play in bridging these divides. So somebody comes to you, is in charge of HR at, say, a police department. Mm -hmm. and says the, the way that we're doing diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, training isn't working, but we really do need to have a program to help people through these things and to deal with issues like unconscious bias and those sorts of things that really are there. Well, what would be some ways of structuring that kind of a program that would that would avoid the identity trap, in your view? So a few thoughts on this. The first is that uh, there's great research on diversity programs 
by you know, progressive social scientists like Frank Dobbin at Harvard University, a very renowned scholar. And they found that with very few exceptions, diversity programs are ineffectual or counterproductive. That the way that they are done at the moment do not, in fact, help to pursue any real goal other than allowing corporations, when they're sued for racial discrimination, to say, but we held a training, so we're not on the hook. And part of the reason is that the nature of those trainings has really transformed over the last decades. And that in many cases, they are deeply steeped in the ideas and the vocabulary of the identity synthesis, built on the work of people like uh, Robin DiAngelo, who interprets any disagreement with her view of the world as proof that you're somehow guilty, as a proof of white fragility. In one training that was shared on uh, LinkedIn and bought by many corporations, which uh, was taken by many, many employees at Coca-Cola, for example, uh, she had a slide instructing people in ways to be less white, which is, I think, a very unhelpful thing to say to employees who happen to be white. The content of her slides was also really disturbing. There's this idea that virtues, which are human virtues, which we share with our compatriots of every race and ethnic origin, are somehow hallmarks of white supremacy, that if you care about the written word, or if you care about punctuality, or you're a perfectionist, that somehow is a hallmark of white supremacy as though African Americans and Latinos and Asian Americans weren't just as capable as anybody else of uh, loving the written word or of being perfectionists or of taking pride in what they do. So I think there's an easy win in pushing back against those forms of diversity training, which are pseudoscientific, which are deeply divisive, and which take us in the wrong direction. Now, how to build better diversity trainings is, is a hard and challenging question, but I think that the first step has to be to embrace what some new people in this field, like Chloe Valdery, a great young African-American woman doing this kind of work, call the common humanity approach. It is in keeping with that research in social psychology, creating situations in which we have joint tasks, in which we encourage to get along, in which we build the trust to then be able to share, and in which the message from the authorities is not that we're definitely going to come to blows because we're parts of different groups, but that we share the fact of our humanity and that that should be the basis for us to try and understand the experiences that each of us has. Let me give you one, one other example here. You know, there's a new literature in, in philosophy and other parts of the academy that has become very influential in activist spaces and which has deeply shaped these forms of diversity trainings. And that is to deny the ability of people who stand at different intersections of identity to understand each other. And this is really a, a, an important and deep failing here. Because of course, I, as a white man, don't naturally understand uh, what it feels like for a woman to be scared to take the subway because she might experience sexual harassment. I know that I, I don't get that experience. And I know that I don't get the experience that a black man might feel walking down the street and worrying that a policeman is going to stop and frisk them and perhaps treat them violently in the process. I know that too. But I want to retain the faith, the conviction that I'm able to communicate with people who've had those experiences and ask them about what it is like for them to live in this country. And that for I might never be entirely walking in their shoes, I can understand enough to say, it's unjust that my friend who's a woman is unable to take the subway at night because she has to be worried in a way that I'm not. It's unjust that my colleague who's black worries about the police in a way that I don't have to. And then we can come to stand in solidarity with each other on substantive terms. Not because I'm saying, I don't get what these people are saying, but we're more pressed than I am, so I guess I'll just go along with the political demands. No, because I've understood enough about them and their experience in this country that according to my own moral convictions. That is an unjust state of affairs that we must remedy. That, I think, is the kind of attitude that, that we should encourage in society and that diversity trainings should try as best they can to facilitate, not to lecture people about white privilege and tell them that if in any way we disagree with what the diversity trainer tells them, 
you know, that's just proof that they're fragile white people who are racist. But your your vision of a diversity training, a common humanity training would, would also include explaining some of those things that say a white man might not even uh, think about that would be challenges for a woman in the workplace or a minority person in the workplace. It, it would not shy away from that, right? No, of course. I think it's perfectly yeah. fine to say, hey, the way you experience the world is mediated by who you are. But then the idea is talk to each other about those things. Don't separate people out by race. Don't say, you know, you can't understand the people in that group, so they're going to go over there and you're going to go over here. And, you know, then some fancy people are going to lecture both of these sets of groups. That's not going to work. Actually get into conversation with each other. You know, I, I'm, I'm a college professor, right? So I think about some of the concrete institutional choices we make in, in, in that context. Now, what did we used to do? We used to put people, as somebody who grew up in Europe, it's always been a little strange to me, but we, you, know, you take these people in the first year of college and they have to actually share a room with some person they don't know. And that person often is very different from them sometimes by, by coincidence and sometimes because college administrators actually tried to match roommates to each other who were as unlike each other as possible, right? An evangelical Christian and a Jew, somebody from a big city, somebody from a rural area, somebody who's white, somebody who's black, right? And many important friendships have come from these constellations. I'm sure that probably half of you who are listening have a close friend who you made under those circumstances in your, in your first year of college, right? That, I think, is a great institutional practice. It's not a diversity training, but it's a great way to actually get people to understand each other. Now, of course, at some point, you have those conversations in the dorm room at 2 a.m. What was it like for you growing up? What are the things that you're proud of? What are the things that you're afraid of in society? Those are the institutions, those are the contexts in which you have those conversations in a genuine way. Now, what do colleges do today? First of all, most students now get to choose the freshman roommate. And the way they usually do that is through local meetups or somebody in their school who's already going to the same college or through social media. Uh, those are likely to be people who are much more like them than the roommates they would have had 20 years ago. Secondly, a lot of elite colleges are building separate dorms for people who are black or people who are Latino. They are voluntary, but are often encouraged by the college. And so there they're encouraging people in a sense to opt into a social environment where there's no chance of those kind of encounters. And then what message are they sending to kids? Are they sending the message that you expect it to get along? Or are they saying, we're going to have an anonymous hotline in which any time that you're upset by something someone says, you can report them for a perceived microaggression and we're going to investigate. That is what universities are doing. That, I don't think, is setting in place the right institutional mechanisms to encourage the kind of communication, the kind of exchange, the kind of integration which we should hope for. So are you optimistic or pessimistic about the country when it comes to these issues? You know, I'm worried about two things. I'm most worried about the rise of you know, the MAGA movement. I'm most worried about what a Trumpified Republican Party is doing to our political system and what it would mean if Donald Trump comes back into office. I'm also very worried, secondly, in a different way, about the influence which these ideas that I cover in the book are having on the United States. In the book, I, 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 in the first part, I trace the origin of these ideas in, in serious thinkers like Michel Foucault and Edward Said and Gayatri Spivak and Derek Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw. I talk about how they went from being influential in universities to really having a lot of purchase in society as a whole over the course of one very rapid decade. Uh, in the 2010s, I talk about the way in which these ideas are now being applied to all kinds of areas of our public life. Two that I haven't talked about are cultural, the idea of cultural appropriation, the fact that we should be very concerned about influencing each other in the cultural sphere in a way that I think goes against some of the most beautiful things about America, our ability to be inspired by the donuts you eat and the food that I hopefully one day might be privileged to make you. It has huge influence on our, on, 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 on our public policies in ways that I think are really concerning. And then I try to tell people how to argue back against those ideas, how you can recognize that these ideas are wrong-headed. They're not going too far in the right direction, they're going in the wrong direction. And I want to give you a guide to people for how to argue back against them without falling into the reactionary trap, without falling in with some of the loudest people 
on cable news and on Twitter who are shouting about wokeness to cover up their ill intentions. So I am worried about these ideas as well. But in the end, I'm relatively optimistic. And I'm optimistic for two reasons. The first is that when you zoom out a little bit, it is clear that America is doing better on these points. Um, you know, in the 1960s, 4% of Americans, 4% of Americans thought that interracial marriage was morally acceptable. Mm. Today, 95% of Americans think that it is morally acceptable. And this is not just people telling pollsters what they want to hear. We know that uh, the number of newborns who have parents of two different racial groups has actually increased by six, sevenfold over the last few decades. When you look at what American life is actually like in the day to day, it has become in so many realms genuinely more diverse with people cooperating along those lines. So that's one reason for optimism. And the other reason for optimism is that I don't think most Americans uh, buy into either of these extreme ideologies. Uh, you know, there's a great poll I saw recently about Americans' attitudes towards history. Most Americans, uh, even if Republicans don't believe that Democrats would say this, think that George Washington was a great man and we should honor him. And most Americans, even though a lot of Democrats wouldn't think that Republicans would think this, want slavery to be taught in school, want us to be literate about the deep injustices that happened in our history. And you could say similar things about so many other areas of our public life. Most Americans, I genuinely believe, are conscious of the existence of racism and other forms of discrimination and want to genuinely live up to the noble ideals in our constitution, in our declaration of independence, in our bill of rights. They never want to uh, deny the existence of problems, nor do they think that these problems are so deep and insurmountable that we have to rip up our institutions. And so what I want to do with this book is to be a guide to people, is to allow people to see the most serious, the most even-handed, the most thorough set of arguments against these corrosive ideas, the case for a society in which we actually live up to the ambition that uh, who you are determines who you are, what opportunities you have, less than it did in the past. Not because we ignore injustices, but because together we resolve to overcome them. The book is The Identity Trap, a story of ideas and power in our time. Yasha Monk, thanks so much for being on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. The Russell Moore Show is a production of Christianity Today. Executive producers are Eric Petrick, Russell Moore, and Mike Cosper. Host, Russell Moore. Producer, Ashley Hales. Associate producers, Abby Perry and Azure Phelps. Director of Operations for CT Media is Matt Stevens. Audio engineering is provided by Dan Phelps. Our video producer is Abby Egan. And the theme song for The Russell Moore Show is Dusty Delta Day by Lennon Hutton. Mm-hmm.